Hello and welcome to another video tutorial from PlunderHD.com. My name is Jonathan Lampel, and in this video we're going to be going over how to do a lens vignette the right way. So I say the right way, not as in it's the only way or the only correct way to do this. However, it's the most useful technique and gives the most accurate results with the greatest amount of artistic control. So the way I usually see this done inside of Blender is by taking an ellipse mask like this and blurring it and then maybe multiplying it with the original image. Now, this works for simple things. However, it doesn't give the most accurate result. First of all, you need to make sure that your uh, settings exactly match your render settings, so your image, and then it'll work. You also need to tweak this um, width and height control for every single time you do this. And also, you need to make sure that, you know, if you change your image, it's going to pretty much mess everything up. Uh, and so, I thought there was probably a better way to do this, and so I looked to Photoshop to help me because they have a really nice vignette in the Camera Raw tool. So I sort of backwards engineered that and stuck that inside of Blender with a group node, and it works really well. So let's take a look at that. This is what we're going to be building in this tutorial. So we just have this vignette node that we can plop right in, and it's going to work right off the bat. And you'll see that it gives us a much nicer result. We have controls for strength. We have controls for roundness, which we can see a bit better if we turn the feathering down. So if we turn this all the way up, we'll get a very round center. And if we turn this back, we'll just be getting the edges right there. Let's turn that back up a bit. And we also have a highlight control. So this preserves the color right around the edges. So you can see that once we turn this up, the edges are no longer being sort of muddled. And so you can control how bright those highlights are and how much color is preserved. And we also have a control for shadows if you want to bump those up to get more of a cinematic look. And so the cool thing about this is not only does it work really well and you can just drag and drop it into your scene, but you can also put in an image of any size and it'll work great right away. So let's get started. So here I am starting fresh with a new scene. You can use any image that you'd like to follow along. And the first thing that we need to do is to get that sort of ellipse shape. Now instead of using the ellipse mask, which we have to tweak the size of and is dependent on the render size of our scene, we're going to use a lens distortion node. So let's go Shift A, Distort, and Lens Distortion. And when we crank this up, we're going to get that nice sort of wide beach ballish shape. And the lower you set this, the uh, less of the distortion that you'll get. And so this can end up being our roundness control eventually. Uh, once we have that, we're going to need this to be a completely black and white image because we don't want these colors to interfere when we're mixing them in. We only want the black and the white. So let's just use a mix node. I'll use a color and mix and just mix with a regular white image, clamp that, and we'll be good to go. So now we just have black and white to work with and that'll be perfect. However, if we go to blur this now with the filter and blur node, I usually use fast Gaussian, set this to relative, and that way we can just enter a percentage, like blur this 50%, and another 50%. Uh, you'll notice that we're not actually blurring it, we're just scaling it. It's uh, kind of pushing it out instead of actually uh, blurring it. So what we can do to fix this is actually use a normalized node. So let's just go to vector and, not normal, vector and normalize. And this is going to convert the values to be everything between 0 and 1. That's just going to reset the image to a regular black and white image, and we should be good to go. So I can see that the blur is working nicely, and the blur size here is what's going to de determine our feathering. So, so far everything's going really well. Let's go ahead and figure out how to mix this with our original image. So, the first way that most people do, at least that I've seen, is to use a mix node and then go with multiply multiply with the original image here and that's just going to darken the edges and that works great in some cases but not so great in other cases uh, for instance if you have highlights around the edges or lots of uh, saturated colors and things that you want to preserve then it doesn't really work it doesn't single out any area of your image it just kind of plasters it over the entire thing so a way that I like to do it is use overlay so let's I guess we can just duplicate this multiply node, set this to overlay, and let's see what a difference this one makes. Okay, looks like we have to switch these two. All right, so now if we have a factor of zero and a factor of one, 
and it's a little bit more subtle. It brightens up the center as well as darkening the background, or darkening the edges, which works quite well. If we turn the size down to zero, you can see exactly what's happening. You can see that we still have some of these highlights preserved right around here, and it's still keeping in some of that color, which is really nice. So I definitely recommend using overlay in most cases. However, sometimes multiply is a bit better depending on what you're working with. So let's get a simple control to mix between the two. So now with just using the mix node, we can easily switch between the two and that's going to be our highlights control. Now that we have our basic setup, let's go ahead and group this together. So I'm gonna press B, box select all this stuff. Now, if I press control G right now, we're going to get a whole lot of inputs right here. Well, three of them, I guess. Uh, so I'm going to press shift and click and drag down, and that's going to sort of group those all together in one little node socket, so that if I select that as well, and now press control G, we're going to group them all together with one handy image input with one image output. And so now I can tab in and out of the group node. Now, we need to set up our inputs. So first of all, let's just do a normal strength input because that seems like a first thing that you'd want to probably change. So I can duplicate this mix node right here, mix that with the original image, and you'll notice that by mixing between the two, we are going to get our strength. Now it looks like zero is fully vignetted and uh, one is no vignette. So let's just switch those around and plug that factor right into the input there. Now you can see that once you slide something into the empty socket, it'll just bump it up and add that input automatically. So let's press N on the keyboard to bring up our properties panel. And I can double click on this factor here to rename that to strength. All right, so now if we tab back out of our node, we can just change this strength value with the slider right there. And it'll change accordingly and it's very handy and easy to use. So let's see, the second input that we want to add is the roundness. And remember that's the lens distortion uh, value right here. So we can plug that in and that'll just add the distort. And I can rename this to roundness. Okay, so this is all good, except that we can get negative values and I'd rather just keep it between zero and one, but even zero, there's not going to be any vignette at all, and so if that's the case, then there's not really any point in this node. So it looks like the lowest value that we want is actually 0.05. But to keep it nice and user friendly, what I'm actually going to do is use a map range node. So I can go to uh, vector map range, and this is just going to convert our range and sort of clamp it down. Instead of going from the minimum of zero to the maximum of one, let's go from a minimum of 0.05 as our minimum value to the maximum of one. So now if we plug this in instead, what we're going to see is that if we, I guess we can still turn that off to zero. So let's cancel that and plug the node back in. And there we go, we have limits of zero and one, but even when it's set all the way down to zero, we're actually getting a point uh, value of 0 0.05. So that's something that you can do to make everything a little bit more user friendly when you have strange values to work with. You can use map range and also color ramps, which we'll use in just a second to make things nice and easy to use. So the third input that we want is the feathering input. So that'll be really easy. We can just plug this size value right into here and that'll just control the feathering and it'll work pretty much right off the bat. The next thing that we want to put in is our highlights. So remember, that's just the value that we had right here, mixing between multiply and overlay. And it looks like a value of one is multiplied while a value of zero is overlaid. So to, if we have a control that preserves our highlights, you would think that a full value would preserve them the most. So let's just switch these two around so that a value of zero is multiplied. And we can now plug this factor value right into there. And let's go ahead and rename some of these really quick. So we have strength. The second one was roundness. Then we had feather. And then highlights. And the last input that we're going to use is shadows. 
So you'll notice that if we take a look at this mix node, if we pull this down, that's going to bring back some of those shadows back into the image. Uh, and if we look at the end result, the less that we mix this, the more the shadows are going to be sort of pulled in. So uh, I'm going to take a converter and color ramp, plug that in, and I can just flip the values just like that. And then take this factor value, because this is actually supposed to go into the image. This is going to be the factor. Taking this factor and plugging that in there. And so essentially, we're just reversing the 0 and the 1. So now when we have this down to 0, we don't have any of those shadows added back in. And when we have this to 1, we get them added back in. So this might give your scene a good cinematic look. It doesn't look very good here, but in some images that I tested, it does look pretty cool. So let's just rename this to Shadows. And there we go. We now have our nice vignette node. We can name it Vignette. Whoever decided how that's spelled is not a very nice man, but that'll work. And I think the last thing that we should do is set the automatic values of this, or the default values. Because right now, we don't have our default values set to something intuitive. So let's make sure that they're all set correctly. So strength, the default value is 1. That makes sense. Roundness, default value is 1. Uh, let's set that to 0.5. The feather is set to 1. Let's set that to 0.5 as well. Highlights, we can leave that at 1. And shadows, let's leave that at 0. So now when we go ahead and we add a group vignette, we're going to get those values right away and so we don't have to make a whole bunch of tweaks right out of the gate we can get the value that is most likely to work with the most amount of images and so here we have a node that is very easy to use and you can use it for any of your projects so you can download this uh, from the link below on my website blunderhd.com and i hope you find it useful and i'll see you in the next video